Hello. Hello. I'm just having a little. She's having a little coffee. Oh my God, have you seen that thing? It's like, don't talk to me before my morning coffee. So annoying. I'm kind of like that these oh, days. Don't be one of those people. I got a coffee there, but sometimes they make me honestly like a bit shaky. I'm all right with it. Yeah, I know. She like has one and sleeps. So you sleep like a I lot. I have one before bed sometimes. Weird. No, no, At no, a restaurant, no, no. my whole family, we order a coffee after dinner. I talk, you know this about I me. know you do. I do an affogato sometimes, a little bit of ice oh, cream. An affogato. What's that? Is that what they're called? Affogato. Yeah, they you are. You know all these like weird and wonderful things. Like I, I've seriously like, I found a permission on Zap the other day. A permission? They are Okay, so we've got a really epic guest on today. We're we never excited. we get a bit nervous when we have a guest. On we today, also though. are very cheesy with our guests. <gasps> we are. I'm sorry. So if you've ever been on our podcast, you're we're welcome. only happy people on that are going to benefit you guys. Really, yeah, like, yeah. Good we advice really think about what you guys would like to. Yeah, hear. and also that we're going to like be seriously interested. We can sink our teeth into it. Yeah, we've got a few coming upcoming guests that we're we very excited about. <laughs> but right, today, so today, she's basically anonymous. She's so anonymous. We don't ever reveal her identity, but you get to hear her words. Her wise, words of wisdom. Wise words of wisdom. La la la, let me explain. You guys may have like heard of her. She's a best-selling author. She's an anonymous relationship expert. She's known for her raw and honest dating relationship advice. I mean, she's got an Instagram, which is just incredible. And she's got, actually, she's got a column in the OK Mag. She's pretty cool. And she's got a book. She's got a best-selling book. Yeah. Block, delete, move on. It's not you, it's them. She's got a lot Bloody going on. That. Okay, so please welcome the one, the only, la la la, let me explain. We're so grateful and so excited to have you on. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Yay, thank you. Obviously you're blurred out so no one can see because you are anonymous. I'm totally anonymous. Yeah, I'm I'm like the Z-list poor Banksy of the dating world. I literally said earlier, I was like, she's like Banksy. Yeah. Didn't I? I wish I was more financially like <laughs> Banksy, but yeah. <laughs> I'm the, the shit no, version. You've got your best selling, best selling book. Yeah, this is true, but you know, authors don't make any money. What? what? Yeah, authors don't make any money. If you, this is why I've got a real. P- people often will tag my book and be like, I lent this to my friend and then she lent it to her cousin. Oh, and I slowly die inside because I'm like, I only earn about three pence or something off every book and I don't even earn that yet whereas Jeff Bezos gets like six ninety nine. Oh fucking so hell, yeah Jeff if you've Bezos. got a book that you like don't pass it around your friends unless you're all really you know cost of living crisis but if you can afford to buy it for your friend get it so, um, but it is it's a dating guide it's the dating guide that I wish that I had before I started dating it's genius. just literally everything in there that I think is, is aimed at women mm-hmm. heterosexual women but loads of people have messaged me to say that they can apply it to whatever to yeah. whoever they date and I wish more men would read it because I think it would give men a lot of insight into, yes. into the experiences yeah. that we're having uh, on the dating scene but yeah it's, 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 a, it's a good book and it's helped a lot of people so I'm really proud of it that's amazing. That's we do get boys listening into this and they ask yeah. us dilemmas. And I love it because I think as two girls, you know, we can only speak from our own like experiences or our own thoughts. And I think yeah. that boys just, They're we are very different. And like the way I hope They want to know the way that we yeah. understand things and the way that we see things. Often, you know, there are the really toxic boys, but there are the really like shy There's boys a lot of good who are ones. just, you know, not. Yeah, that want to understand how to like, yeah, a girl to like them, but they're the good ones. Yeah. We just wanted to sort of know where it all started from you for you. Like also, yeah. why the anonymous? Sorry, that's not a question that we have on here, but I'm just quite intrigued. Yeah, so I um started off as a social work. Well, I started off as a sexual health and relationships educator about 20 years ago now. Uh, I worked for the NHS delivering sexual health and relationships information in schools and prisons, at all settings for people under 21. Uh, and then that motivated me to go into social work. I wanted to go into child protection. Mm-hmm. So I was a child protection social worker. I started that around, two, well, I started studying for that in 2003. That's amazing. That must um, have been pretty hard. You must have seen some really. Yeah, it's a very brutal, yeah. it's a brutal job. It's, mm. uh, it's, 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 it's a lot. It's a lot. That's amazing you did that though. Thank you. I mean, it's a really hard job and like shout out to anyone who's on the front line in social services, especially now because things are so awful that the government has stripped so much money oh. from social care that children are so vulnerable. So shout out to everyone who's still out there doing it. Um, so I was doing that, um, and I kind of specialized in domestic abuse. I, I had a real expertise in that. But at the same time, I was also 
dating men and mm. having a really shit time of it. And so I was at work, like helping people to manage relationships, helping people to leave abusive relationships. Yeah. But then I was going home and like, Begging, for your own dramas. begging a man to treat me better, you know? So it was like I had all this professional knowledge, but I didn't actually apply Maybe it to myself. It to yourself, I was just yeah. some reckless Which is fool. what we all do. Yeah. Um, and I just, I, I, I always call him the fuck boy that broke the camel's back because it was like <sighs> I'd had this kind of string of failed romances. And then I dated this guy and he really gave me hope. And then it was just another one that was just like narcissist, waste man, whatever, label, every label you can think of, it could have been applied to him. And then I just had all these light bulbs going off in my head. They were all just like, oh my God, you're an idiot. And that was a red flag. And what, what have you been, it was like everything started connecting in my head. And I just had this big urge that I wanted every other woman to know. Yeah, it's like I wanted to go it. up to women in the street and be like, did you know when they do this, this is what it means. And I thought, you're like right. the book of knowledge. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like and I just really, really seen had every this strong scenario. urge. So I, I decided to put it out in a blog and uh, but, and that's why I was anonymous because I was still a social worker. Right. And oh, I was writing okay. really personal stuff about yeah, my yourself. dating life. So it was just like, let me write this out. Like it's almost like a diary. And then it just went viral and then everything just sort of followed on from there. So you've really seen every angle of the dating life and like just life with men and relationships, and just, the whole thing. Yeah. You just had like a urge you needed to help people. Yeah, it was just this kind of, it was just like everything makes sense to me now, mm. you know, whereas it should have before because I've been doing this work for a really long time. But then, yeah, it was just, I, uh, it made sense and I just wanted to put it out there. I had no intention of making any type of career out of it. Didn't think I'd be able to leave social work, but it's all just kind of snowballed, happened accidentally. Yeah, and it's, essentially, you're still helping people, so it's still in the same line. Like you're still giving people advice, you're still helping them, you're still there for them, and yeah. you know, it must. It's pro probably very rewarding. Yeah, I'm still a qualified social worker, and I do see the work that I do as social work. It's more like social work education. So yes. I'm hopefully putting out information that might help people to prevent ever having to be under Go social through services, it anyway, yes. you know, so, and my podcasts, my original podcasts were classed as CPD. So anyone who's like a therapist or a social worker or a midwife can listen to my old podcasts and that counts towards their professional development. What? Oh my God. That's yeah. incredible. So, That's amazing. I'm not sure about the new ones, but you might as well listen to them anyway. Please, you know, can you just tell, the, just for all the listeners, the these old, are yeah, Lala's new, new podcasts. They're going to be, if you've listened to my old ones, they're quite different. My old ones were really long form and they were kind of deep dives into things like child sexual exploitation, right. domestic abuse. Wow. The new ones are going to be very different. So I'm working with Sony Music um, and it's going to be three times weekly short episodes. They're about 15 minutes each. Uh, and on a Monday, we'll be doing hot topics. So, for example, say we were recording this week, the hot topic might be something like the Jonah Hill yeah. story, yeah. you know, so we'll have a look into that. Ooh, and then on Wednesdays, I'm going to be uh, stepping into my agony aunt mode again, which is what I do for OK Magazine uh, on a Monday. Um, so people can send in questions and I'll answer the questions. And then on a Friday, it's going to be basically making my Insta come alive. So we do lots of different things on my Insta, like ick stories, fuckboy replies. Um, oh, interesting. Oh, I wonder why they are like. So we do all of that on, okay. on the Friday and we'll have guests and stuff. So it'll be more kind of fun getting you into the weekend to have a fuckboy free weekend, basically. <laughs> You've got I, a good mix of everything going on yeah, there. That's you lovely. Really do. I'm interested to know, like, this may be very personal, please don't feel like you have to. I'm interested to know, because you've obviously seen the worst of the worst. Like, do you sort of, are you very wary with guys? Like, how's your dating situation now? So I'm sort of seeing someone. Okay. Um, but I... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm open to trusting people. I'm not, like, paranoid or anything. Yeah. I... I have got to work really hard to not become sort of a desensitized, but also to I hear so much. Like if you were to open my DMs now, there would be a hundred new messages from somebody, women mainly telling me some awful thing that's happened to them last night or today or something. Like, oh my God. You know, it's constant, wow. it's constant. And it's really easy to just go, men are fucked. Like, I can, I can swear, can't yes, I? Yeah. Yes, can. Men are fucked. Like, what is the point in this? The safest option for any woman would just be to stay, stay away, away from them all. But at the same time, I also know 
so many amazing men. Guys out I there, know yeah. so many people in beautiful relationships. I have so many men contacting me uh, who are just lovely and who are doing the work. And so I do have that faith and I, I feel quite sure that I know the red flags and that I'm in a position now that I would run from them if if they appeared. Yeah. Um, and and I'm actually not really that scared of getting hurt because I know that to be open to love, you, you have, have to, to risk be open to hurt. a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have so. to like like expose all your vulnerabilities and like part of that is just the process, really, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And if you don't really, you'll never sort of fully opening yourself up to that yeah. sort of yeah, exactly. situation. It is quite scary. So I guess we just wanted to sort of like get some advice and insight into you, like what you would give our listeners. There's um, also questions that we have from our listeners that we're probably not yes. very, and qualified is the wrong word, but we don't have any we're experience. We're not that qualified. Let's just put it around. We're not that qualified. <laughs> but we we don't know what to say. We probably give, we're, ve we're very opinionated, but perhaps it's not. On what we would do in scenarios, but for example, like this first question is, dating as a single mum, how to make time, how to meet people, how to approach the fact you have children, etc. We're not very good at maybe approaching that subject because we don't really have any experience mm, yeah. in that. So dating as a single parent is a really hard thing to mm. do. You know, dating is hard anyway, right? Yeah. But since the dating apps have like blown up and taken yeah. over yeah. and have become the kind of primary way that people would meet, meet people. people. I can't even imagine. It like, has I, opened I up them. this whole new like realm of... Just Shit. how on earth, like, how would you create? For me, when I text you, I don't know if you're replying. Well, obviously, I know you say, well, you're my best friend. But sometimes, like, you just get lost in translation. How are you ever meant to gauge what someone's like or if they're going to pick up on your jokes? Yeah. Like, yeah. I think, it, and what's happened is that things like ghosting have become really common. Like, just par for the course. Like, people are just casually throw away people that they've had connections with because that's just what people do now. Can't bothered. Yeah, it's socially acceptable now. It's like, oh, I'm just yeah. not gonna write them. Yeah, I'll add them. Well, it's exactly. just being more of a coward, isn't it? It's just easier yeah. to not reply for. It's so unbelievably common, and I think people just treat people in a really casual way. People aren't investing. People have are, are often dating with this sense that like mm, this is okay, but maybe there's something better. You know, it yeah. used to be back in the day that you would have your one partner and that was it, and you were so committed. Now it's like. Oh, but there's five other girls. You can't just that might be scroll better. these. Like, and I also think no, no, no offense to these TV shows like Love Island, but it's very much so. Like, it's. It, I feel like it's normalizing. Like, oh, but there might be a bombshell that walks in. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to close myself off to you yet, even though we have this great connection because someone better might come along, and I, I want to have fun in Castor and Mont, all this shit. And, and I'm like, all like, it's giving this really bad. Mm. Like, yeah, I think I agree. Examples because when I first started dating in the nineties. You know, you had a house phone, you had a landline. Yeah, that That's all it. we had. And then we had pagers. And if you met someone, you weren't really sure whether anyone else was going to come around at any time soon. So that's all you had. And if you didn't hear from them, you'd go to their mum's house. Yeah. And Are you alive? Door. If something bad happened yeah, to you. Or reverse charge, call them from a phone box. You know, like life was really different back oh, then. God, and people, it would have been easier. It was so easy to get a boyfriend back in the 90s, early 2000s. And then things have changed dramatically, but not only have they changed dramatically, but also then your life changes dramatically when you become a single parent. And so as hard as it is, if you don't have any children, because I guess you can you can put more into it, you know? If you are going on lots of different dates, it's just kind of okay, because that's you. Whereas if I am going on a date, I have to contact my mom first to say, hi mom, um, could you have him on the 15th or whatever? And then if she can't, then I'd have to go back to the date and say, hey, could you do the 26th? And then if they can't, then I'm like, mom, could you do the third? God, it's you, a you lot know? of logistics. And then they fucking and ghost you that, and well, they well, don't tell. Then, then by that, are they still even around four weeks or two weeks later when you finally got your six hours of child-free time? And then after that, when, you know, how do you arrange the next day? And actually, if they don't have any children, they can't. How do you broach the fact that you say, They're probably more likely to be, you know, they're going to want to date that woman who's freely available during weeknights and whatever. Mm. So, so, and then if they've got children, it makes it even harder because you've got to coordinate your child-free weekends. With them and It's really, really, I would have thought it would have made it easier if they had children. She'd have it's that maybe sort of like, easier because it's more, they're more understanding. Yeah. But the logistics is probably yeah. harder. Well, because if you're, so I have my son every other weekend and then if I meet a man and it's happened a few times where their weekend clashes with mine, so they have their kid when I don't and vice versa, then it's just it's And impossible. probably, I assume you're quite protective over who your son meets. You're not going to just be like, 
well, let's blend all the families well, on that's, the first that's the thing as, a, as a, you know, a big tip for single parenting dating is really take it slow and mm. you can't, I, I mean, it wouldn't be a terrible thing, you know, say you got to know someone and it was a few weeks in and you both had kids similar age, it wouldn't be a terrible thing or traumatic to any child if you were to say, hey, me and my friend, yeah. uh, we're going to go to the zoo and they've got a child your age. You don't have to say, this is my new boyfriend. No, exactly. Straight um, away, you're right. You know, so yes, you yeah. can do things like that without that being problematic for a child. But obviously, you know, I wouldn't, again, I wouldn't recommend this to a single woman either to invite men from dating apps to their, their house. Just don't do that like in the early stages, yeah, you know. But if you have children, like extra don't do that. Like if you want to be reckless with your own life, that's absolutely fine. But you can't be reckless when you have a child in the house. Yeah. So because you're, that, so, you're responsible for them. Yeah, you, and, and your child comes first no matter what. Of course. And I guess it makes you more conscious about the red flags and about the decisions that you mm. do make again because it's not just you you know when I was you know before I had a child you could just like all right well um, he yeah. seems really dangerous but he's so hot and now yeah. it's like yeah he's hot he's dangerous that just can't run anymore you know help us with the psychology of like why we all because we're all guilty of it kind of just like a bad boy well, I mean, a lot of it is probably down to your attachment style. Because actually, I, I really... <laughs> I'm, I'm fucked. I've got loads of that. <laughs> I, I, I must be. I want to get away from the idea that women love bad boys. You know, women love being treated badly. Because this no, is they definitely don't. like <laughs> an emerging theme that's coming out of a lot of these misogyny podcasts. I must just you know. stop. Like, I'm married to someone who is a very good boy. Like, he, he oh, can, yeah, be, yeah, la- he can be more sweet. I'm probably the harsh one in the relationship so I haven't I have stayed away from that but obviously like when you're younger you you do just sort of if you're rejected there's something you want the more I mean I think it is really common because a lot of people are anxiously attached or yeah. have like disorganized att- attachment styles and I mean so so there there is it's, it's a very complex thing the mm. whole women and bad boys thing and I mean I, I I took that to extremes like I was very much into like you know people who were going to jail and selling drugs and you were like you I know, can change them that's uh, one yeah, extreme I, I, I wasn't just like oh, I want a bad boy I want the worst like <laughs> I want the gang member off the side of the road no I've got a friend who's literally like that like yes. the more fucked up they are she's like come to mama I'll <laughs> yeah, protect yeah, you yeah. and I'm like no not him again <laughs> it was this it was I guess terrible, it, it was it? this weird sense of like they can protect me and also I loved the idea of making a really hard man softer it's that I can also, fix I feel you like they're, they're more vulnerable they need people more yeah like, and I when they crash they're high and then they get yeah. high yeah. That. then there's that then I've always had that social work tendency of like sure. I can help everyone there I can go, change yeah. everyone's lives yeah I can fix so, you so hey you little crack dealer <laughs> like let me let me be your shining light um, <laughs> obviously I'm over that now that is That's a long good. time in the past <laughs> was there a point where you were like this is quite dangerous well not really I, so I've got ADHD and I grew up same, same, in same. quite a a chaotic household and my dad was uh, quite an emotionally abusive person and I have always been quite addicted to chaos and I think a yeah. lot of people will find that the the patterns of the relationships that they're choosing now are very linked to their childhoods. Mm. And so if you if it was yeah. familiar to you to be in a state of chaos, volatility, to not know what was going to happen next, to not know whether your dad was going to l- love you and be really proud of you or tell you you were, you know, fat and ugly, that y- you know, as a child, it was like, oh, what next? You know, yeah, that's my, what where's my dopamine to. coming from? And then the relationships that I chose as, as a young Mirrored woman, that. you know, reflected that. I think just leading on from this, I'd like to just know like how to navigate when you're in a toxic relationship. Like lots of the girls have written in or boys have written in saying like how to help a friend when they're in a toxic relationship. What advice would you give to yourself back then? Uh, it's really difficult because I I think that we all know that when you are in something like that, there is absolutely nothing that anybody in the no. entire world can say to you it's so true. that would get you out of it. Absolutely nothing. They could show you a video of you in your future, I don't know, lying on the road as a complete alcoholic because you cannot cope any longer with how much this man has traumatised mm. you. And You're you are still, still gonna not going to go, oh, I've seen my future. Denial. You will still stay. You're not so, done with it yet. So, so it is. It is really important to to know that people are, will never be saved until they're ready to save themselves. So mm-hmm. you can drop little 
gems in every now and then, but becoming like obsessed with trying to save your friend from a toxic relationship will probably just more likely sever your relation, your friendship. Yeah, totally. Um, it, it's important to be there for people. It's important to not make your friendship solely about like, what's he doing? He's really awful. To, you know, make your friendship. A lot of people make that mistake. But sure. make your friendship it's really hard. like a break from that toxic relationship. So when she comes and sees you, it's fun. She's having a really good time. She realizes there is life and liberation and freedom yeah, outside of, her the way out. of yeah. what she's got. And That's you can advice. say, really you know, yeah. I would wait for a friend to like offer you that information. Cause also what you really don't want to do is is put them in a position where, and I, again, you, you may relate, I've done it many times before where I have stopped telling my friends when he's done something, when a man's done something toxic. Then they because hate I the know man. they're going to just be like, oh my God, what the hell are you doing? He's fucking awful. So I just won't, I'm just not going to tell you because I don't want you to say that to me. Yeah, you're so Whereas right. if you've created a, 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 a friendship, a safe space where you're not constantly berating my boyfriend, mm. then I'm more likely to come to you when he's done something that I need to talk to you about, you know, and, and then again, it should never be like, this is abusive. You know, why, why are you still with him? It has to be like, you know, what you just said, I, I, I would find that worrying. Um, you know, just drop the little, drop the little nugget into their head so that they realize that maybe they think about it in a different way, but yeah. don't be like determined to make them Black think and differently yeah. And yeah, about their, them about into their a partner. Decision. Just yeah. let them know that you're always going to be there for them no matter what. Um, but but don't try to force anybody to to leave a relationship. It's yeah, because you'll be just the one who lose. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. So why do we think people suddenly get the ick? Is the ick even a real thing? Yeah, Oh my is. God, it is. Yeah. I know it, it is, is, but I do feel like there's this sense of like, oh, I'm, you know, it's the way I tied up my shoelace. I've got the ick. Like, no, I do. That's not a thing. No, let I me saw explain. a boy's toenail and I was like, ick. Yeah. I take responsibility for being the person that bought the ick to Instagram. Now, Stop. I know I didn't invent the ick. I know it came from Love Island. The ick is not just general turnoffs. You can call that the ick because the, the word works. Oh, sure. That. I get it wrong then. But so, so for example, I could say, oh, I get the ick when a man picks his nose and eats his bogey. Of course, everybody is going to get. That's a, just a general turn off. Sure. Right. The, the thing about the ick is that it is a rational totally unreasonable and it is beyond your control and I don't know if you've ever felt it I have but I it have. is like a sudden repulsion and it's usually with somebody who you really like and it can happen for absolutely no reason I really like this guy and he turned up at my house and he had a bit of mud on his trainers and I was like oh my god and that was it I couldn't look at him for the rest of the night I couldn't have sex with him which was what we planned to do <laughs> and you can't say to someone it's because you turned up at my door with mud on your shoes I know because that doesn't make sense like and it wasn't the mud it wasn't the shoes it was the ick I've had the ick from someone wearing a t-shirt with a pattern on it and again it wasn't bad fashion or anything it's just one of those things that when the ick hits it hits and that is why it's really important to talk about because actually you can feel like a massive bitch when you get it. Because totally. you can think, how can I end a relationship with this incredible human who I really want to have something with? How can I end it with him because he dropped his glove? You know? Drop <laughs> dropped his glove. glove. Oh, or, or he did a little trip up a step. You know, how can I put... What a, <laughs> he did a little you know, what trip horrible up a person am I like to end it? But, but actually, it's really important for us to share these stories because... It's normal. Because it's a thing. And it's actually, instead of trying to continue to date somebody who you feel totally repulsed by, <laughs> the sound of them breathing makes you feel sick. And you try and force yourself because you think there's no reason for me to feel like this. But you've got the ick. Um... And there's lots of different reasons behind why people yeah. think the ick might happen. So there's some explanations that are rooted in like evolutionary psychology. And this is particularly for uh, women. Obviously, when we're dating, whether we want kids or not, we're all subconsciously assessing whether this person yeah. is going to be a the good father of our child. parent to our child. Yeah. And a lot of the, the ick that comes from, you know, them tripping up a little bit or them, I don't know, hitting their elbow on a car door mm. or something. Again, which are not things that you should end a relationship with someone sure. for. But apparently there may be something within our brains that goes, eh, that person's a bit clumsy. They're going to drop our baby on its head. So they're not going to be a safe 
partner. Wow. So I cut that one out because they're not going to hold my baby no, properly. this is fascinating. Oh, this is blown my eye. There my. are also explanations that are like rooted in obviously attachment and things like that and, and self, self-defense self really, like self-protection and self-sabotage. So you're thinking deep down within you, you, you have such a strong fear that this person is going to reject you, that you are searching for whatever it is that you can find to reject them first, to protect yourself, to sabotage the relationship before they can do it to you. And when does that, when you say that's to do with attachment, what would your attachment problem be before be, that to start that? Well, it could be any of them really. So people with uh, uh, avoidant uh, attachment styles will also be quite prone to the ick um, because they will get this kind of sense of suffocation and intensity, like if somebody likes them too much. What's an avoidance? If you've got an avoidant attachment style, then you are somebody who can probably have a bit of intimacy, probably likes a bit of intimacy, but when it starts to get too real, you panic and you feel suffocated mm. and you want to mm. avoid. So you, a lot of fuck boy, a lot of men mm. will have avoidant uh, attachment styles. And that's actually because attachment is, is always developed in childhood mm. and it's related to the people that we first bond with. So our caregivers. Yeah. And what we do with a lot of girls, if you raise girls traditionally, people will be very like wrap them in cotton wool. And if the girl falls over, it's like, oh my God, darling, are you okay? But then when our little boy falls over, we're like, get up, big boy, don't cry, move on, you sure. know? So then we are raising, you know, a, a little boys who are not used to getting that emotional attention and, and, and that love and that empathy that they might need in vulnerable situations. We tell them, be a man, you know, men don't cry, grow mm. up. Uh, and so what that does is that, that that leads them to have a quite uncertain attachment to their caregivers. They know that their caregiver is going to be there to give them food and tuck them in at night, but that person's not going to be there to meet their emotional needs. So they, they develop do. an avoidance attachment oh because they don't God. think that in their adult God. relationships Wait, what other attachments they're going to get those there? needs met yeah. you know so anxious so I'm well I don't know if I'm anxiously attached because it's all very complex and it's difficult to kind of diagnose yourself because I've always gone around saying I'm anxiously attached and I blame that on the fact that my dad left my mum for her best friend when I was seven and my mum's best friend was quite close to us so there was this whole thing with inside me that my dad left me for another woman, you know, sure. at age seven. That's how yeah. you take it in, isn't it? Like I couldn't make yeah. my dad stay. Yeah. So I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough. And on top of that, I had a dad who would tell me, I can't take you out today because you're too unattractive. You look <gasps> disgusting. You oh look like gosh. a tramp. I had a weekend plan for you, but look at your hair. We can't, can't leave the house, you know. Yeah. So of course I've grown up like, do I look okay? What do I need to do? You know. It's all about your childhood. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. And, and so I'm very anxiously, or, or I thought I was very anxiously attached because the way that I approach relationships is like, oh my God, love me, love me, love me. Yeah. If you haven't answered my message within, good enough. within an hour, like you're gone, you've rejected me. You've left me for that. My mum's best friend, you know, yeah. that's somewhere deep inside sure. me. Uh, although I wonder if I'm anxiously attached because I'm, I can make brilliant friendships, you know. I have really secure attachments with women. I get on really well with women and I can bond with people really easily and mm. I don't fear that they're going to leave Rejection. me at all. So I have very secure attachments mm. and attachment style with women, but I have quite, I'm quite disorganized, a bit anxious with with men, although I'm learning and I'm, I'm working on that in therapy. But if somebody has been like seriously abused in childhood, then they will have like a, a, a fearful uh, avoidant attachment style. Um, and those are people who are very afraid of love, but then can be very intense and very codependent. It's all messy and, Gosh, and everybody's it's so it's going to play out differently for everyone. God, and like it also just explains so much about like... Mm why relationships are just so fucking hard. That's so complicated because we're all so different. We've all had different childhoods. We've all gone yeah. through different like ups and downs and like no, you know, that builds who you are, that forms who you are. But you, yeah. it's hard for two people then to gel and like you become one almost in a sense. Yeah. Like, you merge your lives together, but 
you're taking on their troubles and they're taking on yours. So. Yeah. And that's why I think it's really important to, to, you know, once you're deep into a relationship, actually having that vulnerability and being able to really, A, understand yourself. Mm. You can't understand your partner as well if you don't understand yourself. But so to, to strip that back, like understand their childhood, understand their insecurities, what they went through, you know. And some people have really beautiful, strong you know parents who Mm. who raise them impeccably but it's still you know those people will likely have a secure attachment a lot of people are just very securely attached and and what does that mean yeah so that means that you can you can make bonds with people you are open to love um you're probably pretty good at communicating you don't have any anxiety if somebody doesn't uh message you back after a couple of hours you're you're secure in yourself you know that that love is available to you you know that you're emotional needs are going to be met and that you can meet your own emotional needs as well um you're just you're just secure so secure people can be really good if you've got one secure partner and then an anxious partner Mm. the secure partner can be really good for the anxious partner but two like an anxious and an avoidant together is the worst the worst that you could ever have because right. avoidance pulling oh, away yeah. and anxious is, is, is on. literally having a nervous breakdown because the avoidant is pulling away you know this it just doesn't work so interesting i can't green <laughs> pink red flags well that's three different things yeah so obviously everybody knows what a red, red flag flags are good. and i think it's really important to know what red flags are especially if you're heading out into the world of dating get really familiar with what you think the red flags um w- you know with what they are uh, you can read that in my book. Um, so a red flag is danger, run. You know, like if you're sitting on a date with somebody and they tell you that they've just come out of prison for killing a woman, right? Run. Of course, you're like, Quite an obvious that's just like red massive flag red flag. Yeah. There's no options, just go. Um, but, but red flag doesn't always have to be about domestic abuse. It can also be if they turn up to the date with a wedding ring on, big red flag, mm-hmm. they're married, go. A pink flag is a step below a red flag. So it's not something that you immediately need to run necessarily, but it's a warning sign. It's a potential. It's I'm not entirely sure. They've said something a bit odd on the day and I'm going to mark this down as a pink flag. It's not enough for me to run, Mm -hmm. but it's enough for me to mark it. Then if we go on the next day and they say something equally as odd, then I've got two pink flags and two pink become a red. You don't want to collect pink flags. So, or maybe you might, you might be able to have two pink flags if you've got three absolutely just just run but again you're going to have pink flags for different things so a pink flag for someone who's married that might be they don't turn up with the wedding ring but they can never facetime you they can never have any communication with you after Mm. like work hours or whatever they can never invite you to their home so all of these things are like warning signs but you don't have the evidence you don't have that you know final thing so so if they never FaceTime, that's one pink flag. But if everything else is fine and they're inviting you to their house, there's no more pink flags. But if they're not inviting you to your house, to their house, they're not FaceTime, you know, then you've got the red flag. Yeah. The, the, got the it, red flag got it, got because it. you've collected your pink. Uh, green flags is actually what we should be on the lookout for. Fine. We shouldn't even go on dates on the lookout for red flags because no. then you're just in a really shit state of yeah. mind. Yeah. You're, you're looking, not being you. You're not manifesting You're not relaxed. Words. Exactly. You're looking for danger. Don't do that because you will see them. Yeah. Red flags do appear. You don't have to search for them. They they, they make just come themselves up. It's very like reading a boyfriend. You're going to find something you don't like. Yeah, exactly. Well, they just red flags stand out to you what you need to be looking for is your green flags so what are your green flags what do you want from somebody do you like somebody who is really laid back and chilled or do you prefer someone who's like really charismatic and charming and the center you know what are your green flags is so for example a green flag that's really important to me as somebody who's a bit anxiously attached is consistent communication that is such a big green flag for me and if they're coming with consistent communication um, they're letting me know where I stand they're providing me with reassurance they're making me feel good they've got healthy morals they treat their mother beautifully you know they'll it'd be different for everyone but know what your green flags are yeah uh, and and know that when you know you're out there dating there are people who can meet all of your green flags yeah. and you hold out for them and, get, and be on the search for them how do you help people navigate through chemistry and then get over that in order to see the pink flags. Because I 
I personally believe it's so possible to like fancy someone and have a huge attraction, have major chemistry with someone without even speaking to them. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I've had it on the tube before where I've like seen someone and I've been like, whoa. And I'm like, I could I could fall in love with you, even though we've never spoken. So when you do then have maybe two conversations with someone, you've got something going already that you really feel within you, like you feel something. Is I feel it's quite hard to be that you get blinded by that. I How think do you, you are a limerent person. What's that? So <gasps> you tell me, tell me what I am. I do not get that. I have to like I fall in love with people purely for their personality and the way they do, like that to be. Not well, well, I fall in love like that, but I've. But I don't really, I, I'm I've not had attraction with what you're talking fancy. about. So that's lust anyway. Yes. Yeah, but so. Yeah, well, you all think people are fit, but I would never want to like pursue anything. Well, you're married, so I'd hope not. No, well, you're in a relationship, so I don't know. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is with my partner, I fancied him an insane amount when I sat down and we said like two words to each oh, other. Right. Okay, I get but it. But I'm saying if he then had pink flags how do you help someone navigate through that by not being blinded by it but i think that that is a lot related to like limerence and infatuation so it's really important if you're learning about dating to learn about limerence you can have a look on my instagram i didn't even know this word limerent limerent, i've got limerence highlights on my instagram and i also talk about limerence in my book and i'll definitely be doing limerence as a hot topic on the new podcast okay limerence a lot of people don't know about you never heard of it and it is and a lot of people don't experience it, but a lot of people do. And it is that thing of you meet someone and you really fancy them and you become almost infatuated yeah. by them yeah, yeah. before yeah. you even know them. Like, yes. And you can't stop thinking about them. You've matched with, dating, uh, with them on a dating app. You might be talking to 10 other people on the dating app who you've matched yeah, but with, you're but there's this on. one. Yeah, that's and this one on. feels like, oh my God, they're going to be something big like yeah. because I just fancy them so much. And this is, I'm feeling this chemistry, you know, but it's... How much is chemistry and how much are we telling this story? It's, it's a story in our minds. In our I minds. I have that Leonardo DiCaprio thing from The Great Gatsby. That's what I have. I haven't seen that, but oh, yeah, maybe he's I a limerent no, person too. You know The Great Gatsby? Uh, I said this on the last podcast I did with Jamie. He thought, he met this girl, Daisy, years and years and years ago. They had like a one night stand and then it would been, it'd been like seven years since he last saw her. But he then had this infatuation. He obviously didn't love her. He met her once. He created this whole story and scenario yeah, in his brain yeah, of how yeah, amazing yeah. that it would be you when they were reunited they reunited and she was like crazy and it never worked out and like yeah it was not what he expected but he was so infatuated that he just like ignored all the red flags and this just is literally on. limerence is that infatuation yeah for some reason you cannot stop thinking about them your day is dictated by whether you've had contact with them or not you know like if you you could start off the morning with this deep sense of just like oh my god that i haven't heard from them i just feel sick i feel awful the oh second they validate you by just messaging like hey babe what's up or something you know you're like, you're like oh, oh my god. god like i can listen to my favorite song again and the sunshine's coming <laughs> through the windows wow he said what's up i actually don't have that but this is a very <laughs> but, but it's a very common thing i'm sure it if is, yeah. you've ended up in a relationship with the person you had limerence yeah, for so then I it's never different felt... limerence does works differently so if you Fine. both have limerence for each other then you don't have any of the anxiety you just have the initial infatuation and then the limerence goes it's away amazing, because amazing. you've come together okay. limerence is it, it, you feel the limerence when the other person isn't limerent for you too so, so someone's just not that into you but you know, That's, sometimes they, they can be into you, you but your them. limerent energy can actually end up putting them off. Have a look oh at my, my limerent no, highlights on Instagram. Have you given your Instagram handle? Because we it's must. at la la la, let me explain. Right, we're all going to be spamming I a whole am evening. absolutely mind blown. Why don't they teach us this shit in school? Oh, oh my God, I wish the they fuck? did. Forget that. Yeah, we've all got Pythagoras rule, but none of us know what the fuck's going on like in our lives. I wish we had so much longer. We probably kept you too long. And no, I that's like, fine. Oh, I we... have more questions. Okay, so um, we're going to be listening to your podcast every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. When oh, is it all so. way out? So, so can you say out. the name of it? Just it's so coming we know. out on Monday the 17th of July is the first episode. Putting it in the diary as But make sure you listen to all three because they'll all be totally different. different. So if the Fine. hot topic's not for you, then you might really enjoy the dating dilemmas on a Friday. Um, it's called It's Not You, It's Them, but it might be you. We're so grateful. <laughs> thank we you so, so much. Thank you so thank much. You. It's been so interesting. It I can really has. All day and listen to it. And we're definitely really going to do a part two. Uh, but thank you great. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Love you so much. Thank you.